Welcome to the Hunt Back Country Podcast, episode 47. Tonight, Steve and I are talking about pack fitting, pack loading, and related topics. I'll say right up front, this is a tough thing to talk about on a podcast when you don't have visuals, when you can't show angles and straps and things of that nature. But Steve and I bounce around and do our best to address some of the most common questions that we've received from you guys, the listeners, as well as the most common questions in general that we get when we work with Exo Mountain Gear users. Now, keep in mind, this isn't exclusive to Exo Mountain Gear packs, so if you're not an Exo user, no problem. You should definitely be able to get something out of this, regardless of what pack system you're using. That said, some of the aspects do tailor specifically to Exo packs, or at least that's our perspective. As always, we appreciate the feedback, guys, so consider emailing us with your follow-up questions, comments, to podcast at exomountaingear.com. As always, if you're enjoying the show, we'd love to see your review in iTunes. That helps tremendously so that iTunes will show this podcast to other future listeners. All right, let's dive into this episode talking about pack fitting and pack loading. All right, Steve, welcome to the podcast. How are you tonight, buddy? Uh, I'm doing very good, man. It's um, literally three days away for me mule deer hunting, so it's kind of like I'm sitting in my guest bedroom office here at the house, and I am neck deep in all my gear and clothing and food laid out all over the place, so it's kind of a a good atmosphere to sit here and talk about uh, gear and pack loading and stuff like that. Absolutely. In fact, when this episode goes live, you will be out in the backcountry chasing a mule deer. I will yes. be the guy stuck on the computer putting this <laughs> podcast up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll be leaving uh, here just in three days. Um, Going to be a solo hunt. Go out for probably four or five days. Um, it's kind of a new area, a new tag for me. Um, I've scouted a couple times with zero luck. Um, found a lot of elk and no deer, so it's been uh, kind of frustrating. So I'll be going into a spot completely so blind. Are you not seeing yeah. the quality you're after? Not seeing the numbers you're after? Just Both. no, no deer. Yeah, I've been kind of, yeah. I've been, you know, I've been kind of aiming towards a bigger buck. So I've been picking some off the wall places that, um, you know, I don't think uh, there's going to be a lot of deer. But when you do see a deer, he's going to be nice. You know, a place where a buck can grow big and old. Mm-hmm. And I've just been striking out. You know. Um, just haven't had any luck. So, um, yeah, I'll be heading in blindness. I think it's the first time I've done that on a deer hunt where I haven't, like, scouted an area and gone back to it. I'm just going into a completely new area and been studying Google Earth as much as I possibly can, trying to learn every nook and cranny of this area I'm going into, you know, where I can glass from and, you know, where it looks like a benchy spot where I could throw a tent up and stuff like that. Yeah. So you, is Monday opening day? Yep. Okay. Yep. So you'd be right there for opening day, right? Yep. On. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. In the midst of uh, in the midst of gear, I mean, we've we've done gear episodes for sure. I mean, last year, way back in episode four, we kind of did an A to Z gear list for you listeners that are newer to the podcast. Go way back in time and check that one out. And then more recently, in episode thirty four, we kind of talked about. Um, really your gear setup specifically for early season mule deer hunting which you're obviously doing Mm -hmm. and that coincided with the um what's in your pack series for exo mountain gear so if you guys haven't seen those as well uh head to youtube.com forward slash exo mountain gear and then we have quite a few of those from yourself and um other exo users kind of detailing what's what's in their gear list but maybe kind of highlight just to rehash a few things steve of what's maybe changed for you this year or something new you're trying um you know just kind of give us a, a brief gear update as we begin to talk about gear and packs and things for this episode yeah um yeah not a whole lot has changed for sure um i did order some darn tough socks about a month ago and i've used those on these scouting trips been very impressed with those i've never heard anything bad from anybody that's used them um so trying those out uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I did make uh, made my own little custom butt pad today, like just a super thick, super comfy one. I <laughs> uh, just glued some uh, Cordura to some foam, and uh, I know I'm going to be spending a lot of time on my butt here the next uh, 
as soon as that hunt opens up. So yeah. have a nice comfy pad there. So that's something I've heard oh. you mention before. Is that a potential exo product accessory something that yeah could yeah yeah i think so um maybe down the road we're, we're kind of testing stuff out right now i mean it's pretty pretty basic and simple but it, it's lightweight and folds up and you know comfy so yeah are you using foam that you use in the pack now like in the waist yeah. belt or yeah, yeah. actually the one, the one i just built today was some foam we ordered for prototype purposes like two years ago it's an inch thick um really super soft stuff so it's when it's folded up, it's two inches thick, um, but it uh, I, I made it just so it kind of folds in half. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Sweet. Uh, see, I'm looking around on the floor here. I just ordered some, I, I think we've talked about in the past, but just cheap rag wool gloves. I ordered on Amazon, ordered a few more pairs. They're like seven bucks each. Yeah. I've never found anything better. Keep my hands warm in really cold temps. Keep your hands warm when they're wet. They have kind of, they're durable. Uh, and cheap. These these ones are just a military surplus glove, and yeah, I, I freaking love those things. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Uh, still, you know, tent um, or sleeping pad. Still a thermo rest. Um. Uh, I am trying out a new uh, slick tripod. They just came out with one called the five two two light. I saw um, Rob post something about a new model. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's basically the same specs, if, for those who are familiar, as the 624 as far as weight and compact, but it's got five leg sections like that ProMaster I use, um, so it can get about a foot taller. Um, mm. And then what I like about the Slick, I always like just how compact it is, you know, folded up. It's really a tight little thing. So uh, I'm just trying that out. You know, I love my ProMaster, um, but this is just kind of one of those test it out, see how, use it on the hunt, and, you know, when... That way, when people call in, you know, I can make a good suggestion one way or the other. Yeah. Um, for my tent shelter, I'm sticking with the Jimmy's Granite Mountain. Um, I did use one of their new tarps on a scouting trip, and it was, um, you know, it was, uh, I basically had to take it down in the middle of the night because the wind was blowing so stinking hard, and I was, it's one of those times where I had no choice but to sleep up on a ridge because there just was no flat spot, so I was just like kind of 10 feet over the edge of this ridge and it was like 30 mile an hour winds all night long and the problem with that tarp and a lot of tarp setups is uh you know how many stakes they need i think this one needs like 12 stakes which yeah. you know if you're in elk country pine needle moisture it's fine but up on 10,000 feet on a rocky ridge getting 12 stakes in the ground is freaking hard yeah uh, and yeah i'm still the shelter thing i've just still never been totally um satisfied right i mean it's just kind of keep bouncing around trying different things you know this granite mountain's been super nice it's it's great for early season it's super lightweight but you know i know if i had it on that in that storm i would have had to take it down um Mm -hmm. just because it would have i mean the wind was blowing hard uh and you pitch those i mean you often pitch those a little more open too right so like if the wind hits that you know at the right direction it's essentially a sail yeah, that, that Granite Mountain definitely, if you hit, if the wind came in from the wrong direction. So I'm when I'm pitching the tent at night, you know, getting ready to go to bed, I'm definitely pitching the, the side that sticks down into the wind, you know. So it's kind of going up and over, not acting like a sail. Then I've never had a problem with it. Um, I know on that night, the wind was just all over the place. You know, thunderstorm came in and, you know, it was kind of left, right, up and down. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Tents are tough. Um, there's a... Lenny and I are just talking about it a bunch here recently, and it's just, you got to find that, you know, again, elk hunting, piece of cake, you know, it's more lower country, rolly. I mean, granted, you can get into them and and high nasty stuff, but for the most part, it's not as bad. But when you talk about high country deer hunting, it's rocky, steep, you know, finding places with uh, a big flat spot, nice soft ground to stake into just few and far between um so i was just about ready to order like a the big agnes fly creek you uh the their ul1 again just i mean that thing's a yeah pretty bomb proof uh very minimal footprints pitches really tight uh freestanding you know i just hung up on it just because i don't since i've been tra- packing a trekking pole the last few years it just seems really redundant to pack tent poles on top of trekking poles and the extra weight and mm-hmm. um i don't know yeah tent, tent uh, shelters are an enigma I haven't figured that one out yet so yeah. um what else uh 
Jeez, I think that's about it. I'll be we have uh, that Benro S2 head and goes on top of that tripod. That thing is silky smooth, very very nice head. I put a custom um, had a friend order a carbon fiber handle and we kind of cut it cut it out, cut some grooves in it to make it work with this Benro. So it drops it under a pound, it's like fifteen point six ounces, which pretty sweet uh, pan head for sure um, at that weight and. Um, Man, I think that's about it. Other than that, everything's pretty much, nothing's changed since the last podcast we did. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah I'm digging in, trying to set up my elk gear, man. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 always fun. I'm uh, getting my food bags ready and all that, and I still have about a month, but gosh, I'm so freaking anxious, man. <laughs> so anxious. <laughs> There's got to be a cat out front. Greta's going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can hear that. Yeah, she's uh, ready to hunt. Yeah. Oh man, I know chucker season's right around the corner. Yeah. I'm freaking, I can't wait for that. So. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I can sneak out in the middle of September and get some of that done. So. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, game bags. I am trying. Um, uh, Jimmy Starps have made their own game bag. And it's oh, have they? Really? Yeah. Really, really nice. Super lightweight. Very similar to kind of like a tag bag, but the fabric. I've been impressed with because it's really breathable. Kind of just hold it up to your mouth and blow through it, and you know you're getting a lot of air passing through it, or the tag bag doesn't have as much. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'll be using those and um, uh, excited so is, to test them out. See is how that they hold something up. He has available now, or he's just testing. I've, yeah, them? yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, oh, they're cool. he's selling them now. So yeah. the whole kit was I can't I can't remember. It was like five or six bags. It only weighed like five point six ounces or something like a crazy, crazy light. You know. For a meal deer, I'll only pack two bags. So, yeah. Um, I'm pretty much non existent on the weight side. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I use the tag bags and they've been good, but I could see I could see a more breathable option for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Good uh, deal. So, yeah, I got everything's here and, I, and I'm going to start uh, loading it up here real soon. Um, so, we're just going to kind of talk about that a little bit. And, um, you know, one thing, and I, and I know we've talked about this in the past, and I've, I learned it from Lenny, was I'd stopped using stuff sacks uh, quite a few years ago. And the pack just carries and rides so much better uh, doing it that way. And a lot of people get hung up on that they need to have everything in these small little tight stuff sacks that they cinch all down. And um, I really encourage people to try not using them because it's uh, – a, you, you pack up so much faster because you don't got to stuff everything in the little sacks. You just stuff it all in there. So yeah. Um, and B, you know, it just it fills your pack up better. Everything's nice and you know, uh, it, well, basically everything's kind of loose in there. And then you just use the compression straps of the pack to suck it down nice and tight. Yeah. So nothing inside the pack is really kind of wobbling or shifting around. Versus uh, kind of a good analogy would be, you know, do you want to put four bowling balls in your pack or a hundred golf balls? Cause you yeah. know, four bowling balls are going to be all lumpy and they're going to move and shift around no matter how tight you get the compression straps. And all those golf balls are just going to, you know, kind of conform and form this really nice, you know, basically just fill up the pack really, really well. Yeah. So, so I really encourage people to try that. Thinking of, you know, a guy sitting in his gear room, I am now, you are as well looking at everything and say he's going to, you know, take five days worth of stuff and begin to shove in his pack. And Mm -hmm. we can talk about some of the basics of how, you know, to distribute weight and where to load things. We'll get to that for sure. But I'm curious on a pack like the XO, and of course this applies to other packs that have multiple ways to access the main loading area Mm -hmm. on the XO being a top loading or your full length side zip or your horseshoe zip on the day pack, right? Yep. When you're filling up from empty, are you using that top loader? Or are you opening up the zipper, going that route? Um, um, what's kind of the pros and cons there, if any? I seem to, I kind of do it in stages, I guess. I go, um, you know, loading principles. You want the heavy weight kind of in the middle of the pack, ver- both vertically and kind of horizontally, right? Um, and uh, so the the very bottom is always my sleeping bag. And then... You know, like my bivy sack and tarp and pad go on top of that. And then from there, I start putting my stove, the jet boil, come of the, you know, maybe some of the heavier food items. Uh, and then I put my clothes up on top of that. And then like very top of the pack would be super light stuff like my puffy jacket. You know, like Uncle Parker puffy jacket will, I'll just throw right on the top. So 
I kind of probably open the side zipper, stuff everything in there um, until that's kind of full, zip that up, and then maybe throw the, like my dehydrated meals and then my puffy jacket in from the top. Gotcha. Um, so, and then another thing I, I do is, you know, my toilet paper is always in my lower left stretch pocket. My headlamp is always in my lower right, along with my water filter. Um, inside my lid is always going to be like my camera, um, a little bit of food, snacks, stuff like that that I can get to quickly. Um, so I highly encourage people to develop a system with the pack. So they're always putting something in the exact same place. And it just kind of goes back to that, um, just efficiency, you know, it's just, you're not, it's dark. You're not fumbling around. Where did I put my headlamp or where's my, you know, oh man, I got to take a crap. Where's my toilet paper? You know, you know, unload your pack. You just know exactly where it is. Um, so it's something I started doing a, quite a few years ago and, and again, highly suggest. Yeah. Do you use uh, waist belt pockets at all? I do. I run one hip belt pouch on the right side and I always just put my range finder in there. Uh, if I'm running video camera that day or something, I'll put my, my little uh, Sony camera in there just for that. Or when I've been scouting, usually my camera's in there so it's quick and easy to get to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in my pockets would be like my wind detector and chapstick and a few things like that probably. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so in terms of, I mean, you mentioned the weight distribution. And just to reiterate, you want to keep the heaviest items midway up essentially. Um, and then kind of, you know, more so close to your back as well, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of centered between, you know, your, your sh- a little bit below your shoulder blades and, and as close to your back as possible. Uh, yeah. So the, the further that weight gets away, you know, the worse it's going to feel, the worse it's going to ride, the more gravity can actually pull on that and use the pack kind of as leverage against you to pull against your shoulders. So some of the worst, like the the prime example is that I've seen people, you know, they got this full load of elk meat in the pack and their gear in the bag, and then they strap the head, you know, to the very, very back of the pack. And that's the worst thing you can do. Uh, you know, make sure you're strapping that on top of everything and then cinch the lid down on, t- on top of it because it's going to ride, you know, 100 pounds can feel great or 100 pounds can feel miserable all depending on how it's loaded. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but actually just... uh We had a guy on Instagram who was testing the pack and doing kind of a heavy hike thing and was just straight up using uh, cast iron weight plates. I saw that photo. (laughs) Yeah, and he just kind of had them hanging from the frame compression straps and hanging down. And he's like, yeah, it feels pretty good. I still need to adjust some things. So I certainly was like, yeah, let's try and get that weight, you know, a little bit higher, a little bit more secure. Right. Um, because, you know, distributing the weight's one thing. And then, as you mentioned, just kind of making sure that it's secure, that it's not, you know, yeah. bouncing around not loose things like that those i mean that makes such a huge difference yeah one thing i'll mention too that just as you're saying that i had thought of is some guys um it sounds funny but don't pull so damn tight on the compression straps that you're about ready to pop a buckle or something like that just get everything snug because the tighter you pull on that you're really kind of you know the the new frame is is really great for this because you can just yank the crap out of it and it's really not going to change shape but if you really at some point you're no longer pulling the load in tight you're actually going to start distorting the pack itself um and you know i said the new k2 frame it's really hard to do that but our older frame you definitely could have um so just snug everything up and you you don't got to like put your entire body weight into it because once it's snug it's going to ride you know just fine yeah one thing i've noticed too and this is just in general with buckles and compression straps is the tighter you pull um, that compression strap tight, the the more resistance there is for it to pull apart, if you will, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. And so it's almost, it, it sounds funny, but the tighter you pull it when you get to that really tight, really stretching point and that buckle is, you know, super tight, those straps actually want to back out because things are so incredibly tight. Yeah. Versus if you snug it up, but don't, you know, totally wrench it down, there's not that sort of pressure for it to release. Yeah, 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 completely agree. Yeah. So in terms of, um, I guess in terms of the frame, we kind of talked a little bit about loading the pack. You mentioned really quick, um, you know, about loading, uh, you know, a head and, and everything like that. Let's just kind of you know, cover the basics for guys who are packing out meat. Um, you know, this obviously applies to the XO, but could apply to other packs with kind of the load shelf, load panel 
type mm-hmm. approach. Um, you know, kind of give us the scenario. I think it's it's pretty straightforward where we have a scenario where we're just packing meat. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the, those guys who are packing some meat and gear out at the same time, maybe that's the first load, you know, and they're kind of packing some camp some of their camp gear as well as meat. What What's the strategy there? Do you change anything? Are you still using the pack bag essentially the same way for all your gear? And then how are you interfacing that with carrying the meat? Um, yeah, I mean, it, nothing really changes. Same, you know, I'm trying to get the heaviest weight as high and as close to the, the center of my back as possible. Um, and then, you know, anything really heavy like a head, get on top of the pack, not behind it. Um, yeah, I, I, it's it's kind of a again those just same principles apply no matter what you're doing. Um, definitely, yeah. I mean that's a mistake, a common mistake I see people is stuff sagging down low, um, and you really want everything above your waist, you know. And and really you need to start kind of way above that because just naturally, you know, you've got a hundred pounds in there. Gravity's going to start working against you after a few miles, and things are going to start sagging no matter what you do. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, if you have a, you know, like with EXO, we specifically design the, the bag even itself for just your gear, it's tapered, you know, in and towards the bottom of the frame so that you really, it prevents things from sagging and sitting in the bottom of the bag. And then how the, the load shelf works with the bag and the frame is that bag stays attached at the bottom and forms a wedge down there, you know, all designed to keep that nice and tight. I've seen guys actually take and loosen the straps on the bottom thinking that they're going to have more capacity to haul haul whatever because the bag's further away and they can scram you know cram more in there and all they're doing is just making that carry a lot worse you know they're better for that to grow you know and stick up like level with their head than sag down below their butt so um yeah it's all about weight distribution you know and different packs do different ways the packs i've used in the past before xo um that didn't have that i would actually use like the, some of the lower compression straps and completely cinch those off trying to create like a shelf that sat like eight inches up from the bottom. So just do everything you can and be very conscientious of keeping that weight high because um, it's just going to ride substantially better. Yeah, that's a really good tip on uh, on cinching that down low, especially with the other packs. Essentially, you know, as you mentioned, gravity is going to want to take effect and yeah. It's like water always runs to run to the lowest spot. By compressing the bottom of the pack, you're essentially, you know, eliminating space that things can settle into. And so yep. really keeping that bottom tight keeps that uh, load up. That's a good yep. point. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. Other than that, um, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about pack fitting. It, it, you know, we've been shipping the new K2 frame and I've been getting a lot of questions on on fitting and we, you know, we always get a lot of questions. Um, and we have a really good fitting video on YouTube that I did last year. Definitely, you know, check that out, watch it. Um, for the new frame, we were able to get rid of the load stabilizer straps and those straps went from the frame panel back down to the belt. Um, and what changed this year for us was we, um, we decided to sew the shoulder harness webbing actually back to the frame instead of back to the belt. Uh, so now you're basically kind of hooked into the frame and there's a lot less of that um, kind of as you're leaning left and right, you're really locked into the frame a lot more. Um, the downside of it is you are you are locked into the frame, so you would lose a little bit of mobility. But we did a lot of little things and how the lumbar pad was sewn to the pack and little stuff to kind of offset that. Um, but uh, so that if you watch the fitting video and you have a new frame, that the load stabilizers don't apply anymore. But everything else does, um, you know. And and I've been, you know, I just had the, I've had quite a few emails just even this last week on guys getting it and messing with stuff. And and I can't encourage you enough to loosen all the straps before you ever put the pack on. Um, one guy was, he was trying to tell me that the belt was sagging on him, and he has last year's skeleton frame. Um, and he sent me pictures and yeah, I mean, it looks like the belt's really coming down at an angle. Well, what had happened is he had tightened up those load stabilizer straps, um, and never untightened them, you know, never loosened them up. Um, and so when he was going to put the belt back on, those load stabilizer straps were already pulling the front of the belt up. And so it was starting in that position. He was trying to tell me how it was sagging. And I was like, well, you just need to loosen those. And he did that. And he's like, oh, I can't believe, you know, mm-hmm. um, that was all it was, uh, 
and you kind of run in the same thing with the load lifter straps. Um, like I had one guy who he was, he wasn't, um, loosening them. Um, and he kept putting the pack on and, and he would kept bringing the torso adjustment lower thinking he needed to lower it, but he never loosened the loads, load lifter straps. Uh, so he kept just actually like almost effectively shortening the torso like double. Cause every time he brought it down, he wasn't, it wasn't, it was pulling really funny. So he actually had with our pack, we have a, an exo symbol uh, sewn there on your right shoulder, and that should sit right around the front of your collarbone. And he had this thing all the way back, like on the back by his shoulder blade. Oh, wow. um, so I kind of had to walk walk him through on the phone about you know, right, loosen up the load lifter straps, move the torso back up, um, get it set, and then you know then you just basically put the ba- put the pack on, leave all the straps loose, and get the belt centered on your hip bones. Um, and so we, we've talked about that in the past. You've got your iliac crest, which is essentially the very top of your hip bones. You know, you can feel down there with your thumbs. It's really pointy. Um, that needs to be the center of the belt, and that's where you want to start. And so it's your, your buckle should be like going through your belly button on average. You know, guys, a lot of guys tend to wear a pack way too low where it's actually like down where they wear their pants, you know, down by their belt. So, yeah, you, you definitely want to get the belt, you know, centered on your hip bones. And then from there... You just kind of start walking the shoulder harness, you know, just kind of moving your shoulders back and forth and slowly pulling on the shoulder straps until they kind of get snug. So you feel the pack kind of suck into your body. Um, and again, just like I was talking about the compression straps, don't overly tighten these things. Just get them snug. Um, and then all you do from there is just go pull on the load lifter straps until you kind of feel the pack at the top suck in. And all that does, all the load lifter straps really do is take the pressure from the top of your shoulders and move it to the front of your shoulders. Um, and so it's not, you don't need to reef on these things. You just snug them up until it gets comfortable for you. Uh, and that's pretty much it. It's really, really basic. But a lot of guys, like I said, if you snug up those load lifter straps and then you take the pack off, set it down, and then you go to put it back on and you don't loosen those, all of a sudden you're starting in the wrong position. And then you go to tighten up the shoulder straps and you're, you're really just pulling on the load lifter straps. You're not actually pulling that harness up and around the top of your shoulders. Um, so, yeah, I just can't reiterate to, to make sure you loosen all the straps, basically, before you put the pack on. Uh, and that's really it. It's, it's really simple, but um, it's amazing, uh, you know, how many guys can kind of get that wrong sometimes and, and then complain about the pack not fitting well. And um, really, it's just a few simple steps. Yeah. I think all of the problems come from, you know, exactly what you mentioned, not starting with everything loosened because... In my experience, when you start with everything loosened and begin to make those adjustments, you feel like that sweet spot for each of those, you know, positions, right? Like you're going to feel, oh, the waist belt feels good there. Oh, my shoulder straps are good, but I feel like that load's kind of hanging. Oh, let's, you know, do the load lifters. Oh, that helps. Versus putting it on and then, you know, like maybe something's right, but you start tugging on something else. It's almost like you have to start with that blank slate and really feel uh, the pack come to you. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just, it's really easy to, to kind of mess with it and get it. So it's not feeling right. And you're compensating by tightening up another strap when you should be loosening this strap. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, trying to think of other tips. Yeah. I got a couple more questions. Not to cut off. A couple more questions come to mind in terms of adjustments while we're talking about it. Um, kind of in, I guess, two different areas. Are there major differences between the way that a guy would be have his pack adjusted? You know, say he's packing in with a week's worth of gear, um, then he's dropping, and the next day he has a pretty light load. How would his pack be adjusted differently? And then I guess same thing. Say he's going from sort of day hunting mode, if you will, to then super heavy. Like, are we just repeating that process depending on the weight? of the load are there additional considerations to keep in mind when the pack's lighter versus when the pack is heavier um the short answer is no nothing changes Um, once it's set up properly it should be set up properly as far as the torso adjustment and making sure you got the right belt size um and there really shouldn't be anything that you do differently (laughs) i don't know i don't want to go down this rabbit hole uh but you can, if you're going to be packing really heavy loads, I would actually increase your torso adjustment about an inch just because of what we were talking about earlier of gravity. Um, you know, lengthen with a hundred, yes, lengthen the torso. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the, and the reason I say that is, you know, 
it's going to take weight off of your shoulders. Um, and, and because you're going to get with a hundred pounds in there, your fighting gravity, I get about in three quarters of an inch to an inch where the pack is just going to sit lower just because of the weight. Uh, it doesn't matter how tight I get the belt. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, and basically I just shortened my torso one inch cause I brought the whole frame and pack down an inch. Um, so one thing I will do with a really heavy weight is I will start with it higher um, instead of centered on my hip bones. Maybe I'll go like, you know, two thirds above my hip bone just because I know there's going to be a little bit of sag there. Um, and uh, or you could do you know center it and increase the torso a little bit. So something I played around with. I mean, like when we're testing and working on the new K2 frame, I'm hiking you know three four days a week with heavy heavy loads on the pack uh, and get a lot of time to kind of play with stuff um what one other tip which i actually mentioned in that youtube fitting video is if you do got a heavy load on you can you know once you hike like a mile things will that that kind of natural inch of sag will set in and it'll, everything will be kind of sitting where it's going to be sitting for the rest of the hike you can actually loosen up the shoulder straps just a touch and then re-snug up your load lifters uh, and that is effectively, you just kind of lengthen your torso. It's doing the same thing. Uh, and so if you're kind of a mile on the hike and feel like, yeah, you got some weight on your shoulders, you know, you can do that. Um, this something that I like with really, really heavy loads is a, a, another tip that's kind of uh, almost opposite of what I just said is, um, you can kind of put the weight, uh, and I've talked to a lot of guys who've done this in the past. You can, you know, you can maybe hike a mile with a lot of weight on your hips and then go ahead and really tighten up the shoulder straps and hike a mile with some weight on your shoulders uh, to kind of move that weight around a little bit. Uh, so that's something you can play with if you're, you know, 100 pounds is, you know, just heavy no matter what you're doing. And usually the loads can be even heavier than that, you know, 120, 130 pounds if you're trying to get an elk out in one trip. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can definitely kind of play with where the weight's sitting, you know, every mile or so, just mess around with it. Yeah. I've done that for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it helps. I, like you said, it's kind of, it's not going to ease the pain, right? It's just going to move it. It's kind of the old adage of, oh, your arm hurts. Let me kick you, you know, <laughs> it's kind yeah. of that deal. Where you just go yeah. from rotating to make your hips right. feel it more to your shoulders feel it more. Yeah. 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 So the, the, yeah, that one tip I was going to mention is really try to find a pair of pants that do not require a belt. Um, uh, you know, a leather belt is really bad. Um, and even, you know, a soft nylon belt is a pain in the butt. Um, so suspenders are great. You got to watch out for little plastic clips that are going to be kind of sandwiched in between the front. Make sure they're not sitting at the front of your hip bones. I had some on some first light canabs a few years ago that about rubbed me raw. You know, I had to like put them around the front of my belt. Um, right now those prana pants that I wear just they have a little cinch on them. So as they, you know, any pants going to kind of stretch out as you hunt in it for two, three days. Um, you can kind of just cinch those back up tight. So it's really nice. Um, but the very minimum, find a really thin nylon belt just because that, you know, when you got heavy weight on and that belt, you know, that sucker is going to be tight cause you're, you know, the weight's just to get that weight to sit on your hips. You got to get the belt tight. Um, and if you put, you know, a piece of leather in between there, that's kind of eighth inch thick and fairly stiff, it's going to cause rub spots and where, you know, you're going to have some bright red spots, you know, no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely run into that problem before, uh, even with the suspenders and those clips that you mentioned. And yeah, sometimes you just have to work around it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. What It seems like there's always quite a bit um, of discrepancy, I guess, you know, in terms of lumbar pad, lumbar fit, and especially sagging in, in the back and the lumbar area. You know, getting that hip belt uh, set up up front on the iliac crest that we talked about is definitely the way to go. But what about guys who feel like, the, you know, maybe they set that waist belt there up front, but they don't feel that the lumbar is sitting correctly? Is that just uh, something to do with the way that they're built? Or is that just an indication that something else, like maybe in the in the shoulder straps, is not set correctly or maybe the torso is not set correctly if they feel that that lumbar pad isn't placed well um that yeah i, I kind of get that question every once in a while um the, the lumbar pad and the waist belt would have absolutely nothing to do with torso uh shoulder harness anything there 
Um, so the, the, that is the very first thing to go on and get cinched down. Um, you know, I kind of get, I have guys like, well, you know, I try to move it up or move it down and it's, no, it's, it's centered on your hip belt, you know, or on your hip bones. Um, you, you can, you know, give or take an inch might be a little bit more comfortable for one person or another. Um, but really it's just centered on your hip bones and, and we, um, you know, we, we have a lumbar pad for a very specific reason is, is you know, 95% of us all have a very natural lower curve to our back. So when your hip bones wrap around, there's kind of a dish back behind there. And that lumbar pad is designed to fill up that space. Um, without it, you're going to get a belt that slides all the way down and sits on the top of your butt. And it gets very uncomfortable because there's nothing to grab. Um, there are a few guys who have, uh, I just talked to a guy um, a couple weeks ago. I mean, he's got a major curve to his lower back where he really needs it like twice as thick of a lumbar pad as we have. Um, and actually sent some thick foam out to him for him to test out. Uh, and then the opposite is a guy with a very straight spine, you know, very flat lower back. Uh, and for him, those are going to be the guys you see on a forum talk about a lumbar pad like it feels like a knee in the middle of their back, you know, because it's really – it's that pad's just really pushing into their back and there's not this void that that pad is normally filling up. But – for, you know, it's at least 95% of the guys, we all have a very natural curve. When we very first developed XO, we went to a chiropractor here in town, and he let me look at just literally hundreds and hundreds of x-rays, and it's all going to be a very similar pattern down there as far as that the curve of that. Um, and so for some guys, one, you know, it might feel a little better one way or the other, but for the most part, um, you know, we designed that for a very specific reason. All right, so that's a good note on the lumbar pressure, and as you mentioned, for you know most of the guys, it's going to be uh, good. We all have that natural curve, but certainly there's always exceptions, and that's you know with any sort of pack, right? Like it's just difficult right. when someone has a, I guess, non-standard shape, right, for a product yeah. to to fit that need exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's we got to build a pack to fit you know ninety five percent of the guys, and it. We run into, it's probably only one out of a hundred where, you know, a fitting issue arises or something like that. And he said, this, this last guy, I sent out a thicker foam for him to try out. And, uh, he, I don't think he has it yet, but as soon as he gets it, he's going to get back to me. Let me know how that works out. And I imagine it's going to, uh, kind of solve this problem for him. Yeah. Very cool. Well, as we mentioned up front, hopefully these, uh, pack tips and fitting tips and loading tips will help you out, whether you are using an XO pack, which obviously we've talked about because that's, you know, where we're coming from. But if you're using something else, uh, hope these tips helped you as well. And I would say, even if you're using something else, go ahead and go to, uh, the XO site and look at that pack fitting video or catch that on YouTube because, Obviously, the process of adjusting a waist belt and shoulder straps and load lifters apply to more designs than just an XO. So yeah, definitely, definitely suggest kind of that that video. We kind of laid it out, did a pretty straightforward job of top to bottom. You know, here in the podcast today, we kind of bounced around, covered a few different topics, but um, really just covers the principles of you know what to do, what not to do, how to get the belt set right, how to set your torso, and um, you know if if you keep it simple and don't refund stuff too much. Um, you know, you're going to have pack ride very comfortably. Awesome. Well, before we go on the, on the XO note, we kind of have some, uh, I wouldn't say entirely new products, but new versions, new additions, if you will, of some of the, uh, accessories and things you want to kind of give us the scoop real quick on that, Steve. Um, yeah, essentially we've just been kind of not adding colors, but making like our weapon carrier um you know we're we're still a very small company and in the past we just did black uh just from a simplicity standpoint of you know just one product to make where we have three colors and we would have to make three products uh but yeah we're kind of you know plugging along here and and just decided just this last week i've been had our so shop make up uh, weapon carriers in in all three colors now so it'll be solid foliage green or solid multi-cam coyote brown etc um, we did do Slurpee stalkers in multicam. We're actually going to phase out the foliage coyote combo. Kind of figured on a Slurpee stalker that is really built for stalking, so might as well just make it camo and it looks pretty sharp. Um, and then the crib, uh, the new accessory that came out with this year, we get a lot of requests for blaze orange. So that is uh, on the website now. You got a blaze orange option for that. So pretty slick if you're a rifle guy and you have to have that uh, orange requirement. 
Yeah, awesome. In the crib, I mean, you know, most guys I think who see that think of that as just a load panel for carrying loads, but you can run that with the pack even outside of the pack. I mean, it could go between the bag and the frame. It can come on the outside of the bag. So it is a great way to add that orange requirement to your pack and to have something that's also super functional for when you get something down. Yeah, that, the crib's a really, you know, we were really happy when uh, we kind of finished developing it. It's a basically an awesome three-in-one product of run it between the bag and the frame. Uh, it's going to keep your meat up high. You know, all those principles that we talked about today of carrying that weight, this is going to keep it even higher. You can control the height up to eight inches from the bottom. It's really good for really big loads because it's going to give you two extra compression straps that come up over the top. You can run it as a beaver tail around the front of the bag. So you can have, you know, if you wanted bright orange on the outside, you could get the blaze orange option. And then also when you get your elk down and you get out with your first load, you leave your bag and gear there at the truck. Crib's already on your pack. You just go back in with, you know, a sub three pound, basically meat hauling, comfortable machine. Yeah, for sure. And you can even run the Slurpee Stalker on the crib, which is pretty cool if you were carrying a bunch of meat and then still want to have your water bladder. You could yeah, attach yeah. the Slurpee Stalker on the outside of that, which is pretty rad. Yeah, yeah we, I just, just had a guy order today uh, a crib, a Slurpee Stalker, and two of our horn hauler wings. He's going to set up and kind of make his own day pack version out of it, running you know all of his gear in a dry bag sandwiched underneath the crib. So pretty slick uh, little setup. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I saw uh, Tyler Boshma, one of the good friends of EXO for sure, running a, uh, a half horn hauler on the outside of his day pack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty cool little setup. Yeah, I think he's putting a spot and scope or something in there. Yeah. yeah. This I one cool thing we've we've done with, with all the accessories and everything, it's we're really using the same buckles and attachment points, uh, and we haven't even gone down that road of explaining all the different combinations that are possible. Um, but there's quite a few if you wanted to kind of get into tinkering with it yeah yeah it's uh it would be interesting to see kind of how many combinations and possibilities are out there it'd be cool to maybe document that one day and show photos of all the different ways you could rig things up oh for sure yeah awesome well if you guys want to check out any of those accessories including the new color options as steve mentioned they're up on the site just head up exomountaingear.com um what else i mean it's pretty much go time guys hope that you're super excited and uh as ready to get out there as we are yeah i'm uh i'm amped up hopefully next time we talk i've got a great story of shooting a high country buck so we'll uh we'll see what happens no pressure steve but i have thousands (laughs) of listeners waiting to hear the story yeah (laughs) all right man get her done all right will do Hope you enjoyed that one, fellas. Once again, just kind of wanted to get some of those uh, tidbits of helpful information out there as we are pre-season, and hopefully you will be loading up your pack really heavy really soon. Again, stay tuned for more episodes. Additionally, be sure and let us know how your season goes. We'd love to see some photos and things like that. Whether you have comments or questions about the podcast or just want to share an awesome field photo with us, we'd love to see it. Go ahead and email us, podcast at xomountaingear.com. We appreciate you listening. Be sure to check back soon.